This book is dedicated to the memory of Dr. J. Allen Hynek. As a scientist, he was the first to grasp the significance of this problem. As a thinker, he understood its relationship to other deep mysteries that surround us. As a teacher, he shared freely his data and his insights. As a man, he wondered. Forward by Whitley Strieber. There are two things about the UFO controversy that make it uniquely interesting. The first is that is probably the deepest mystery that mankind has ever encountered. The second is that it has been the object of so much denial despite the fact that it is certainly a real phenomenon. At the very least it is a social issue of the utmost importance, because it has all the potential of a truly powerful idea to enter unconscious mythology and there to generate beliefs so broad in their scope and deep in their impact that they emerge with religious implications for the surrounding culture. The only thing now needed to make the UFO myth a new religion of remarkable scope and force is a single undeniable sighting. Such a sighting need last only a few minutes, just long enough to be thoroughly documented. It will at once invest the extraterrestrials channels, the Space Brothers believers, and the UFO cultists with the appearance of revealed truth. This unfortunate state of affairs has come about for one reason, and one reason only. Our best intellects have methodically ignored the issue of UFOs for half a century, and have thus left the public without recourse in making sense of the incredibly subtle and complex experience of sighting them and interacting with their inhabitants. There are two reasons that the scientific community has been unable to address the issue sensibly. The first is that the phenomenon is so elusive that it cannot be easily measured. The UFO occupants, if there are any, cannot be studied or even engaged in dialogue and their machines are only rarely seen by trained observers who are also willing to make their observations known to their colleagues. The second is, simply fear. Any explanation of the phenomenon that is now prosaic must inevitably lead to a profound challenge to cherish theories about the nature of mind and universe and man's place in the cosmos. If we come to a correct understanding of the UFO phenomenon, we may well in the process destroy the whole basis of our present beliefs about reality. Sensing this on an almost instinctive level, scientists hide behind the facile posturing of self-styled debunkers who can be counted on to distort or suppress unsettling data in order to leave our current ideas intact. The public is left, as I was left, facing the visitors in the middle of the night without any notion of what they are, where they came from, or how to act in their presence. Absent any genuine understanding of the phenomenon, one is forced to accept that it is what it appears to be. As Dr. Vallee points out in this masterful and groundbreaking analysis, that is exactly what we should not be doing. He places this modern UFO experience firmly in its historical context as the latest manifestation of a phenomenon that goes back at least as far as recorded history. Thus, at a stroke, he redefines it as a part of the fundamental mythology of human experience and enables us, for the first time, to begin to raise questions about it of sufficient depth and resonance to be meaningful. In the process he takes us on a grand journey through the annals of strange and anomalous human experience. He reveals an appalling truth, the phenomenon has been with us throughout history, and never, in all of that time, have we been able to deal sensibly with it. Whatever it is, it changes with our ability to perceive it. The 15th century saw the visitors as fairies, the 10th century saw them as sylphs. The Romans saw them as wood nymphs and sprites. And so it goes, back into time. One of the thousands of people who wrote me concerning my book Communion had this fascinating insight, whatever cosmology or mythology I was immersed in seemed to be the factor for shaping the context and attendant imagery of my experiences, which I believe are essentially of an abstract nature. And yet I myself have faced physical beings, the context of my own experience, with extensive witness by others, makes it clear that the phenomenon can emerge as an entirely real, physical presence that is quite capable of manipulating its environment. The next moment, though, it can evaporate into thin air, leaving not a trace of what was a moment before an immense and overwhelmingly real presence. How could this be? It is no wonder that we have never been able to ask satisfactory questions about the phenomenon. I have even thought that it may simply be what the force of evolution looks like when it acts upon conscious creatures. After all, our entire 5,000 year history is but a moment in the life of our species, less than an instant in the evolution of the universe. 
It may be that our history is in its entirety one of those magnificent explosions of evolutionary force that suddenly change everything, effectively equivalent to the moment when Cro-Magnon Man burst on the scene or the much longer moment when the dinosaurs disappeared. And the visitors, a dark and highly active phenomenon that seems to inhabit cracks in the unconscious, cracks in space-time, and cracks in history, are somewhere close to the essence of what is happening. Dr. Vallee elucidates the basis of what must surely become a new vision of the UFO phenomenon, one that will sweep aside the various levels of illusion behind which it hides. Dr. Vallee argues that the force that now appears in the form of UFOs and attendant manifestations has emerged into history many times, operating as a sort of control mechanism that has altered and shaped human affairs, often profoundly. He demonstrates, for example, that the miracle of Fatima was a sort of hybrid appearing in part as a religious phenomenon and in part as a classic UFO encounter. One is left to wonder if there might not have been a very real technology behind the miracles and apparitions that have done so much to influence the growth of our cultures. Indeed, viewed from this perspective, it can be vigorously argued that most major religions have emerged out of visionary experiences that are, in fact, understandable in the setting of the UFO encounter. Thus the phenomenon becomes not simply one of a group of things that influence the evolution of culture, but rather a primary engine. It could very well be the single most important influence on our history. And it is arguably more active now on a global scale than it has ever been before. This should tell us something about the importance of this moment in history, and should suggest to us that the time to come to a clear and correct understanding of the phenomenon is now. The longer we remain ignorant of it, the more we guarantee that it will retain its power over us. It is time to approach this phenomenon with all of the clarity of mind that it deserves. Dr. Vallee, it seems to me, has taken a dramatically important step in this direction. Introduction, Closed Minds, Open Questions A mystery that has lingered in human imagination for many years, the mystery of unidentified flying objects and their occupants, is coming back to the front pages of our newspapers with a parade of new claims. Not only are these objects seen in the sky and on the ground, but they are said to have contacted humans and, in some cases, abducted them. The public has reacted to these stories with a mixture of skepticism, awe, and fear. The lack of reliable data and the absence of serious research are intensifying this concern. Therefore the time has come to re-examine the UFO phenomenon and to reopen the archives that deal with that ancient dream of our civilization, of every civilization, contact with alien beings. Each culture has sought to assemble this puzzle in its own way, and each culture has contributed something to the great pool of legends, folklore, and traditions that link human imagination with the heavens. Today the rapid pace of technology precipitates a new awareness of the importance of the problem. The modern reader needs a new perspective, a new paradigm in which fear can be set aside and knowledge can prevail. Above all, he needs more facts. In an effort to help answer this need, the present book represents the distillation of some 25 years of research. It gathers and updates some previously published material into a new, more manageable collection of the most significant events that have marked the rich history of the UFO phenomenon. And it leads to a new conclusion, although I am among those who believe that UFOs are real physical objects. I do not think they are extraterrestrial in the ordinary sense of the term. In my view they present an exciting challenge to our concept of reality itself. It is said that, as the 20th century draws to an end and as new discoveries become possible, the minds of many scientists remain closed to this problem. In its June 1987 issue the popular astrology magazine Sky and Telescope noted with sneering, fashionable skepticism that, unidentified flying objects have faded from popularity in recent years. Perhaps as the news media become more aware how little is behind every UFO tale that has ever been well investigated. Ironically, during the same month, two books climbed the popularity charts to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Communion and Intruders contain sensational first-person accounts of encounters with UFOs and confrontation or spiritual contact with their alleged occupants. This coincidence between scientific arrogance and a new social trend illustrates an important fact in our society, while science consistently refuses to consider phenomena that lie outside the safe regions of its current understanding, 
the public is eagerly reaching for explanations that fit its experience. While our scientists remain unaware of important data that could stimulate new theories of the universe, the rest of us miss an opportunity to make serious progress in what should be an important spiritual quest. This book is an attempt to close the gap by examining the evidence for the existence of UFOs, not only in our time, but in earlier ages as well. Such a historical perspective, which is summarized in Part 1 under the Alien Chronicles, is entertaining and often captivating. But more importantly, it is critical to a full understanding of the problem. If these objects have been seen from time immemorial, as I will show, and if their occupants have always performed similar actions along similar lines of behavior, then it is not reasonable to assume that they are simply extraterrestrial visitors. They must be something more. Perhaps they have always been here. On Earth. With us. In my view, the widespread belief among researchers of the field in the literal truth of the abductions is only a very crude approximation of a much more complex tapestry. Another reality is involved here. A reality characterized by cosmic seduction, strange signs in heaven, and paranormal events that present a rich panoply of psychic phenomena. Part 2 is devoted to its analysis, paving the way for Part 3, which I have called a challenge to research, for we can no longer avoid seriously studying UFO phenomena. For a long time, the US military has dismissed the problem because it did not show any hostile intent and did not threaten national security. This argument is no longer tenable. At a time when our government is proposing to deploy the Strategic Defense Initiative, commonly known as the Star Wars system, in space, how long can we tolerate an unexplained phenomenon in the upper atmosphere? UFOs, whatever they are, remain visible to the naked eye and detectable by reconnaissance satellites, electronic sensors, and radar. A future wave of unidentified objects similar to those that were recorded in 1952, 1954, 1966 Oregon 1973 could trigger the SDI network and augment the risk of starting the next world war accidentally. It could even mask a real attack. This possibility is not acceptable in terms of our national security, even if these objects are not hostile. It is equally unacceptable to any of the advanced nations. It can be argued that UFO phenomena are so complex and so far beyond our ability to classify them that no solution can be expected for a long time to come. This is a point well taken, but it should not discourage us from doing active research. Even if we never understand the whole phenomenon, there still may be useful lessons to learn from its smaller components. I would be very happy, for instance, to simply understand how these objects manipulate electromagnetic waves to create retractable light beams with gravity effects capable of pulling objects, people, and animals through the air, or to understand how they paralyze witnesses who come close to them. Imagine a primitive bushman watching a Boeing 747 land. He has no chance, from this single occurrence, of understanding the intricate technology that controls the aircraft's powered flight. But a good look at the landing gear could well inspire a smart savage to invent the wheel. Such is our position with respect to UFOs. Are they real? Why do they seem to violate the principles of our physics? And why are they interacting with us? While the minds of many scientists are closed to the unknown, a few of us believe that these questions are very much open. They provide one of the most exciting challenges ever presented to science, to our collective imagination, to human reason. I do not have the answer to the mystery, but I do have a great deal of relevant data. Much progress has been made in the last several years, and in my own work I have come to think of the UFO problem in terms of three distinct levels. The first level is physical. We now know that the UFO behaves like a region of space, of small dimensions, about 10 meters, within which a very large amount of energy is stored. This energy is manifested by pulse light phenomena of intense colors and by other forms of electromagnetic radiation. The second level is biological. Reports of UFOs show all kinds of psychophysiological effects on the witnesses. Exposure to the phenomenon causes visions, hallucinations, space and time disorientation, physiological reactions, including temporary blindness, paralysis, sleep cycle changes, and long-term personality changes. The third level is social. 
Belief in the reality of UFOs is spreading rapidly at all levels of society throughout the world. Books on the subject continue to accumulate. Documentaries and major films are being made by men and women who grew up with flying saucer stories. Expectations about life in the universe have been revolutionized. Many modern themes in our culture can be traced back to the messages from space coming from UFO contactees of the 40s and 50s. The experience of a close encounter with a UFO is a shattering physical and mental ordeal. The trauma has effects that go far beyond what the witnesses recall consciously. New types of behavior are conditioned, and new types of beliefs are promoted. Aside from any scientific consideration, the social, political, and religious consequences of the experience are enormous if they are considered over the time span of a generation. Faced with a new wave of experiences of UFO contact that are described in books like Communion and Intruders and in movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, our religions seem obsolete. Our idea of the church as a social entity working within rational structures is obviously challenged by the claim of a direct communication in modern times with visible beings who seem endowed with supernatural powers. This idea can shake our society to the very roots of its culture. Witnesses are no longer afraid to come forward with personal stories of abductions, of spiritual exchanges with aliens, even of sexual interaction with them. Such reports are folklore in the making. I have discovered that they form a striking parallel to the tales of meetings with elves and jinn of medieval times, with the denizens of Magonia, the land beyond the clouds of ancient chronicles. But they are something else, too, a portent of important things to come. Today there are many reasons for expecting a change in attitudes toward alien intelligence. Our national scientific effort has temporarily run out of objectives that can capture the public's imagination and enthusiasm. The eager anticipation of encounters with other intelligent beings would help in transcending local conflicts on this earth and in achieving within a single generation behavioral changes that might otherwise take hundreds of years to complete. If this is the contribution of the UFO phenomenon, then we are in fact dealing with one of history's major transitions. Part 1, The Alien Chronicles In the last analysis magic, religion and science are nothing but theories of thought, and as science has supplanted its predecessors, so it may hereafter be itself superseded by some more perfect hypothesis, perhaps by some totally different way of looking at the phenomena, of registering the shadows on the screen, of which we in this generation can form no idea. Sir James Fraser, Owen the Golden Bow. It has become impossible to listen to the radio or watch television without being exposed to testimony about encounters with strange aerial objects and their alleged pilots. While many of these claims seem ludicrous, and some fit easily within the scope of psychopathology, a genuine sincerity shines through most of the stories. Unless one assumes that the world is forever restricted to the normal phenomena already known to science, it is difficult to deny that the witnesses have been exposed to a deep, unusual, and even terrifying event, and that it involves a form of intelligence we have not yet recognized. The temptation is great, at this point, to jump to the first conclusions that come to mind. It is annoying to be confronted with something unexplainable, especially when it is threatening and questions everything we have been taught about the nature of the universe. So we grasp at straws. Perhaps, we fantasize, we are being visited by beings from another planet. Perhaps our government will soon reveal that some of our scientists know about them and can explain their motivation. Perhaps everything will be all right. Those of us who have studied this phenomenon for a long time, in my case, since the intense waves of sighting of the 50s in Europe, have learned to resist the temptation to jump to premature conclusions. If there was ever a situation in science that called for the careful sifting and screening of data and for questioning and testing of every hypothesis, it is the situation presented by the UFO phenomenon. Readers of my previous books know that for the past 25 years I have advocated a serious, long-term inquiry into the phenomenon. I consider the rich experiences presented by the witnesses as an opportunity to do some good science and, even more importantly, to combine the efforts of several sciences to explore an area of nature that is still a mystery. But I have carefully kept my distance from the very vocal groups of researchers who claim that UFOs are interplanetary visitors, 
Such a conclusion is not only premature but is contradicted by several basic facts that become apparent only when one takes a historical perspective of the field rather than studying a single case at a time and trying to generalize from isolated events. Part 1 of this book establishes such a perspective for the reader who may have been exposed only to recent cases and is not aware that the phenomenon has been with us throughout recorded history, not only in the form of signs in the sky, but also with a rich array of reports of contact with strange beings on earth and even of abductions. We are only beginning to relate modern observations of UFOs to some of the ideas that have shaped our folklore, our religions, and our philosophies. It will take many years to reconstruct the links in the chain of personal experiences and speculations that connect the vision of Ezekiel in biblical times with the puzzling, moving, and often terrifying accounts of our contemporaries. But it is not too early to begin. 1. Ancient Encounters Let us start with a simple fact, man has always been aware that he is not alone. All the traditions of mankind carefully preserve accounts of contact with other forms of life and intelligence beyond the animal realm. Even more significantly, they claim that we are surrounded with spiritual entities that can manifest physically in ways that we do not understand. This chapter summarizes some of these traditions and draws a close parallel between the ancient accounts and modern cases of contact with similar entities. I started work on this book during a business trip to Paris. A few hours of free time between two meetings gave me the opportunity to pay a visit to one of the most extraordinary artistic achievements of all times, the Saint Chapelle, which is located inside the Palace of Justice, a block away from Notre Dame. It is an incredible feeling, one which can only be compared to a trip within a jewel or, rather, an entire treasure chest of jewels. There is almost nothing inside the chapel itself, a few sculptures, painted wood, but the walls are made of stained glass, and the various lights of Paris shine through to create a mood, a perception, which is totally alien to the rest of human experience. One of the stained glass panels of the Saint Chapelle shows the abduction of the prophet Ezekiel by an object that came as a whirlwind. He saw wheels within wheels and four strange creatures. He was carried away to a remote mountaintop, where he found himself in a state of wonder and confusion. In my many years of UFO investigations, I have spoken to numerous witnesses, people I could hear and touch and look straight in the eye, who told me they had been caught in a whirlwind, had seen strange creatures, and had been left wondering and confused. They looked to me to dispel their confusion. All I could offer them was the assurance that they were not alone, that many others shared the same experience, and that I believed future science would eventually accept and understand it as an important source of new knowledge. The people I interviewed would not someday be represented as stained glass figures in the chapels where kings and queens bend their knees and bow their heads in worship. They were ordinary people with all the hopes and weaknesses of human beings. But their stories, nonetheless, are worth listening to. The Abduction Experience My first meeting with a woman I shall call Helen, out of concern for the privacy of the witnesses mentioned in this book, their names had been changed unless they had already been published in the media, took place after she called to tell me about a particular motor she wanted to build. Tall and fashionably dressed, she could have been a model or an executive secretary behind a big desk. Instead, she told me she was bent on solving the energy crisis by building a new type of engine. During our interview, Helen confessed that the motor idea was triggered by an abduction aboard a UFO. It seems that she had seen the UFO with a group of musicians coming back from Lompoc, California, to Los Angeles in the summer of 1968. We left after the last performance on that weekend, she told me. We probably packed up the gear by 2.15 a.m. We must have been on the road half an hour to 45 minutes, it might even have been an hour. At that point, we were on a flat stretch of land, there were hills on the right-hand side, and we were going south. Out of these hills came a white light, and it moved up and began to come in our direction. An airplane couldn't have turned the way it did, so we figured it was a helicopter. Then it began to do very erratic things and twists, go very far out and come closer very quickly. I interrupted her to slow down her excited recollection of that episode. I wanted to get the step-by-step -step account of her perceptions. How did you all react to this? I asked. What did the other see? Her reply was forceful, all four of us were very aware of it, she said immediately. 
We talked a lot about it, but nobody said let's hide or anything like that. George and Barbara were up front, George was driving, I was in the back behind him, and Dave was to my right. Dave and Barbara were afraid of it. George and I were encouraging the whole thing, we enjoyed this. All right, so they could have been watching a helicopter. What did the object do? It came up over the car and in front of us, maybe 100 to 200 feet above ground, and it was, I would say, about six lanes of the freeway in width. It was white, and it showed a very beautiful kind of glow. I seemed to remember some kind of windows, but I really couldn't be sure. It didn't make any noise. The thing was big. Four white lights, funnel-shaped, extended from the perimeter of the vehicle and down around each of our bodies. She looked up and shuddered as if it were there, still hovering right above us. What kind of feeling did you have then? I remember leaving my body on the seat of the car and being about three or four feet out of the car, she said in a matter-of-fact way. All four of us did the same thing, off we went. At that point I don't remember anything else, and until fairly recently I didn't think there was anything else. Then I began to realize that something might have happened, because the next thing I remember I was coming back into the car. I looked around and saw the light shimmer around Barbara and Dave, and we were slowly dissipated back into our bodies. I had trouble visualizing the scene. Astral travel is nothing new. That's how witches allegedly went to the Sabbath and Saints to Heavenly Communion. An American businessman and psychic experimenter, Robert Monroe, has set up learning centers complete with training tapes to help people leave their bodies. The psychedelic culture embraced the same concept enthusiastically in the 60s. Perhaps any living entity can transfer its consciousness outside its own body. But automobiles have no consciousness and are not capable of astral travel. What happened to the car? I asked her. The vehicle stayed with us at that time and then began to move off a little bit in the distance, and the car was just going on its own velocity. That was the initial experience of it. At her request I arranged for Helen to undergo a very mild form of hypnotic regression. During that session, she remembered going on board the saucer and observing its propulsion mechanism. She met a man dressed in white, who showed her the amazing motor she is now determined to build. I began checking her story. First, I had a lengthy telephone conversation with George, who hasn't seen Helen in several years but remembers the incident as a turning point in, his, life. Dave has moved to another city, where I traced him. A friend of mine, a psychiatrist, got in touch with him and obtained his statement. Like George, he vividly recalls the whole incident and describes it in similar terms. Ever since the sighting, Helen has felt the urge to build the machine whose principle was revealed to her by one of the saucer pilots. It has become a central point for her, the goal of her entire life. Yet the motor she wants to build could never run, physically, at least in the way she explains it. There are four witnesses to this UFO event, and everything seems to point to the reality of their experience. But this is precisely the place where many questions are raised in my mind. Consider the story from the point of view of the spacecraft theory. Should we agree with most UFO believers that what Helen saw was a vehicle from another planet, coming here for exploration? On the surface, this interpretation seems to fit the facts. But what about the paranormal effects? Can we ignore Helen's testimony that she was teleported into the UFO? Can we ignore the absurdity that characterized the entire episode? How does it fit with a spacecraft idea? The meeting aboard the craft makes no sense if we assume the man in white was a visitor from a distant star. Why would such visitors look like us? Why would they show us a motor that does not have an objective physical function, a motor we cannot build? These are some of the questions to which we will return again and again in the course of this book. Some abduction reports are even more extraordinary. In 1985 a woman named Kathy told researcher Bud Hopkins that she had found herself taken inside an object, in a place that was entirely white, with small gray beings who looked humanoid. Under hypnosis Kathy recalled something like a medical examination. In his book Intruders, Hopkins proposes a scenario in which UFO occupants had timed their visit at the appropriate day of the month to remove an ovum from Kathy, keeping her in a quasi-anesthetized state during the procedure.
Kathy had discovered she was pregnant in early 1978, she was then 19 years old. The date of her wedding, which had been planned for late spring, was moved up to April. Pregnancy was confirmed by her doctors. Yet she had a normal period in March. When new tests confirmed she was no longer pregnant, she cried and found herself repeating, they took my baby. Under hypnosis in 1985, according to Hopkins, Kathy recalled beings touching her, immobilizing her, and performing some sort of operation on her. In other accounts abductees of both sexes have described having intercourse with aliens. Many researchers speculate that such accounts prove that intruders from space are experimenting with human genetics, but they fail to point out that these modern stories are consistent with perplexing accounts that come to us from earlier times, from the oldest records we have. The Age of the Gods It is in the literature of religion that flying objects from celestial countries are most commonly described, along with the organization, nature, and philosophy of their occupants. Indeed, Several writers have consistently pointed out that the fundamental texts of every religion refer to the contact of the human community with a superior race of beings from the sky. This terminology is used, in particular, in the Bible, where it is said, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. The visitors have the power to fly through the air using luminous craft, sometimes called celestial chariots. With these manifestations are associated impressive physical and meteorological displays, which the ancient authors call whirlwind, pillar of fire, etc. The occupants of these craft, to whom popular imagery will later ascribe wings and luminosity, are similar to man and communicate with him. They are organized under a strict military system, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them. These traditions are not restricted to Egypt, Israel, and Mesopotamia. During the period of the early history of Japan ending about 3000 BC called the Joman era, an important artistic activity was the making of earthen statues. At first, these statues were small and very simple. They were made to represent human beings. But in the middle of the period, the artists started to make larger statues showing standard features of a drastically different design, large chests, arc-shaped legs, very short arms, and large heads apparently covered with complete helmets. These statues seem to depict precisely the same occupants similar to those seen aboard UFOs by modern witnesses. On the nature of the helmets archaeologists disagree. In 1924, because he thought that its expression looked like that found on a wooden mask made in Africa, Dr. Hinto Haste proposed that the headgear was in reality a mourning mask used at burials. In the Tohoku area of northern Japan, however, some of the most elaborate statues of this kind show something like a pair of sunglasses, huge eyes with an insect-like horizontal slit, a truly remarkable design. Supposedly, the statues of the later part of the Joman era were first made with earth, then copied on rock or soft stone. Those found in Lomukai, Nambu province, are carved in rock and show helmets. One of them, a Joman Dogu dated 4300 BC and excavated at the Amadaki ruins in the Iwate prefecture, shows details of the front part of the helmet, with a round opening at the base of the nose, below what appears to be a large perforated plate. The resemblance of the Dogu statues to many descriptions of occupants is the relevant factor here. It has led some students of the Joman era to speculate that the statues might indicate the distant memory of visitors from elsewhere. The headgear with its filter, the large goggles, the necks with wide collars, and the one-piece suits are certainly intriguing. Sorcerers from the Clouds It is a common belief that the term flying saucer was made in America. Was it not coined by an American businessman in 1947? Was not the first official investigation of the mystery by military authorities started in the United States a few weeks later? Well, yes. But a farmer from Texas described a dark flying object as a large saucer as early as January 1878, and ancient Japanese records inform us that on October 27, 1180, an unusual luminous object described as an earthenware vessel flew from a mountain in the key province beyond the northeast mountain of Fukuhara at midnight. After a while, the object changed its course and was lost to sight at the southern horizon, leaving a luminous trail. In view of the time which has elapsed since the sighting, 
As U.S. Air Force investigators like to say, it would be difficult to obtain additional data today. It is interesting, however, to find a medieval Japanese chronicler speaking of flying earthenware. The Japanese must also receive credit for having organized the first official investigation. The story is so amusing, and parallels so well the modern-day activities of the U.S. Air Force, that I cannot resist reproducing it here. The date was September 24, 1235, seven centuries before our time, and General Yoritsum was camping with his army. Suddenly, a curious phenomenon was observed, mysterious sources of light were seen to swing and circle in the southwest, moving in loops until the early morning. General Yoritsum ordered what we would now term a full-scale scientific investigation, and his consultants set to work. Soon they made their report. The whole thing is completely natural, general, they said in substance. It is only the wind making the stars sway. My source of information for this report, Yusuke J. Matsumura of Yokohama, adds sadly, scholars on government pay are always making ambiguous statements like that. Celestial phenomena seem to have been so commonplace in the Japanese skies during the Middle Ages that they directly influenced human events. Panic, riots, and disruptive social movements were often linked to celestial apparitions. The Japanese peasants had the disagreeable tendency to interpret any signs from heaven as strong indications that their revolts and demands against the feudal system or against foreign invaders were just, and as assurance that their rebellions would be crowned with success. Numerous examples of such situations can be quoted. For instance, on September 12, 1271, the famous priest Nichiren was about to be beheaded at Tatsunakuchi, Kamakura, when there appeared in the sky an object like a full moon, shiny and bright. The officials panicked and the execution was not carried out. On August 3, 989, during a period of great social unrest, three round objects of unusual brilliance were observed, later they joined together. In 1361, a flying object described as being shaped like a drum, about 20 feet in diameter emerged from the inland sea off western Japan. On January 2, 1458, a bright object resembling the full moon was seen in the sky, and this apparition was followed by curious signs in heaven and on earth. People were amazed. Two months later, on March 17, 1458, five stars appeared, circling the moon. They changed color three times and vanished suddenly. The rulers were distressed and believed that the sign announced a great disturbance throughout the land. All the people in Kyoto were expecting disasters to follow, and the emperor himself was very upset. Ten years later, on March 8, 1468, a dark object, which made a sound like a wheel, flew from Mount Kasuga toward the west at midnight. The combination of the sound and the darkness of the flying object is difficult to explain in natural terms. On January 3, 1569, in the evening, a flaming star appeared in the sky. It was regarded as an omen of serious changes, announcing the fall of the Chu dynasty. Such phenomena continued during the 17th and 18th centuries. For instance, in May 1606, fireballs were continuously reported over Kyoto, and one night a whirling ball of fire resembling a red will hovered near the Nijo castle and was observed by many of the samurai. The next morning the city was filled with rumors and the people again muttered, this must be a portent. Beginning one noon in September 1702, the sun took on a bloody color several days in succession and cotton-like threads fell down, apparently falling from the sun itself, phenomena reminiscent of the 1917 miraculous observations in Fatima, Portugal. Chaos spread all over Japan on January 2, 1749, when three round objects like the moon appeared and were seen for four days. Such a state of social unrest developed, and seemed so clearly linked with the mysterious celestial objects, that the government decided to act. Riot participants were executed. But confusion became total when people observed three moons aligned in the sky and, several days later, two suns. Undoubtedly, the Japanese may have experienced some natural phenomena similar to mirages and incorrectly interpreted them in the context of social rebellion. From this distance, however, it is impossible to separate the reliable observations from the emotional interpretation. What matters here is the link between certain unusual phenomena, observed or imagined, 
and the witnesses' behavior. These accounts show that it is possible to affect the lives of many people by showing them displays that are beyond their comprehension. A brief examination of legendary elements in Western Europe in the Middle Ages will show that a similar rumor about strange flying objects and supernatural manifestations was spreading there. Indeed, Pierre Bostuel, in 1575, remarked, The face of heaven has been so often disfigured by bearded, hairy comets, torches, flames, columns, spears, shields, dragons, duplicate moons, suns, and other similar things, that if one wanted to tell in an ordinary fashion those that have happened since the birth of Jesus Christ only, and inquire about the causes of their origin, the lifetime of a single man would not be enough. According to the 1594 edition of the same book, this is what happened a few miles from Tübingen, Germany, on December 5, 1577, at 7 a.m., about the sun many dark clouds appeared, such as we are wont to see during great storms, and soon afterward have come from the sun other clouds, all fiery and bloody, and others, yellow as saffron. Out of these clouds have come forth reverberations resembling large, tall and wide hats, and the earth showed itself yellow and bloody, and seemed to be covered with hats, tall and wide, which appeared in various colors such as red, blue, green, and most of them black. Especially interesting to us will be the fact that these reports of celestial objects are linked with claims of contact with strange creatures, a situation parallel to that of modern-day UFO landings. Since these rumors have been puzzling to many authorities in the Roman Catholic Church, perhaps it is appropriate to begin with a quotation from the life of Saint Anthony, the Egyptian-born founder of Christian monasticism who lived about 30 AD in the desert, Saint Anthony met with a strange being of small stature who fled after a brief conversation with him, before long in a small rocky valley shut in on all sides he sees a mannequin with hooded snout, horned forehead, and extremities like goat's feet. When he saw this, Anthony like a good soldier seized the shield of faith and the helmet of hope, the creature nonetheless began to offer him the fruit of the palm tree to support him on his journey and as it were pledges of peace. Anthony perceiving this stopped and asked who he was. The answer he received from him was this, I am a mortal being and one of the inhabitants of the desert whom the Gentiles deluded by various forms of error worship under the names of fauns, satyrs, and incubi. I am sent to represent my tribe. We pray you in our behalf to entreat the favor of your Lord and ours, who, we have learnt, came once to save the world, and whose sound has gone forth into all the earth. As he uttered such words as these, the aged traveler's cheeks streamed with tears, the marks of his deep feeling which he shed in the fullness of his joy. He rejoiced over the glory of Christ and the destruction of Satan, and marveling all the while that he could understand the satyr's language, and striking the ground with his staff, he said, Woe to thee, Alexandria! He exclaimed, Beast speak of Christ, and you instead of God worship monsters. He had not finished speaking when, as if on wings, the wild creature fled away. Let no one scruple to believe this incident, its truth is supported by what took place when Constantine was on the throne, a matter of which the whole world was witness. For a man of that kind was brought alive to Alexandria and shown as a wonderful sight to the people. Afterwards his lifeless body, to prevent its decay through the summer heat, was preserved in salt and brought to Antioch that the emperor might see it. Again, with this story, we are faced with an account the truthfulness of which it would be futile to question. The lives of the early saints are full of miracles that should be taken literary figures rather than as scientific observations. The important point is that basic religious texts contain such material, giving, so to speak, letters of nobility to a category of beings widely believed to be of supernatural origin. Such observations as St. Anthony's prove fundamental when religious authorities are faced with the problem of evaluating medieval observations of beings from the sky claims of evocation of demons by occult means, and modern miracles. The details and the terminology of observation are not important to us. It is enough to note that the strange being is indifferently termed a satyr and a mannequin, while the saint himself states that the Gentiles also use the names Fawn and Incubus. Saint Jerome speaks of a man of that kind. Throughout our study of these legends, we shall find the same confusion. In the above account, however, it is at least clear to Saint Anthony that the creature is neither an angel nor a demon. 
If it had been, he would have recognized it immediately. In the 20th century old Indian book of primitive astronomy Surya Siddhanta, it is said that, below the moon and above the clouds revolve the Siddhas, perfected men, and the Vidyaharas, possessors of knowledge. According to Australian writer Andrew Thomas, Indian tradition holds that the Siddhas could become very heavy at will or as light as a feather, travel through space and disappear from sight. Observations of beings who flew across the sky and landed are also found in the writings of Agabar, Archbishop of Lyons, France. Agabar, who was born in Spain in 779 and came to France when three years old, became Archbishop at 37. When he died in 840, one of the most celebrated and learned prelates of the 9th century, he left an interesting account of a peculiarly significant incident, we have seen and heard men plunged in such great stupidity, sunk in such depths of folly, as to believe that there is a certain region, which they call Magonia, italics within quotations indicate my emphasis, when ships sail in the clouds, in order to carry back to that region those fruits of the earth which are destroyed by hail and tempests, the sailors paying rewards to the storm wizards and themselves receiving corn and other produce. Out of the number of those whose blind folly was deep enough to allow them to believe these things possible, I saw several exhibitions in a certain concourse of people, four persons in bonds, three men and a woman who they said had fallen from these same ships, after keeping them for some days in captivity they had brought them before the assembled multitude, as we have said, in our presence to be stoned. But truth prevailed. We will see that the occultists give a quite different interpretation to the same incident. That is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 1. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to Part 2, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.